four, three, two, one, zero. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. Live from the heart of the downtown east side, it's Talk Recovery Radio with Giuseppe Gansi and Darren Gaylor on Vancouver's co-op radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. From the streets to the studio, bringing you addiction recovery stories from real people with lived experience and real experts on today's issues. Tune in live every Thursday, noon to one. Powered by New West Recovery. Real people, real issues, real life. Talk Recovery Radio. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Giuseppe Ganchi, and I'm here on air with my co-host, Mr. Darren Gaylor. Hey, Darren. What's up? What's up? We're doing uh, our Thursday show, Talk Recovery Radio, coming to you live here at Facebook Land and one week behind schedule on Vancouver Co-op Radio 100.5 FM. Uh, still not in the studio at... Uh, yeah, still not there. We still got COVID going on. Uh, so hopefully one day we'll be able to share microphones and, and not get COVID. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Thanks for... <laughs> yeah? I, I, I just wanted to say, I, I was thinking about this a lot last night. Um, it, it sort of feels like we're, we're out of this. You know, we're coming out of this. I don't know if, if people that, uh, you know, from the addiction realm or the recovery realm sort of feel that more than, than anybody else. But I just want to give a big, a big shout out. And, and, you know, to the people that have made it through, the people that like struggled big time over the last, you know, couple of years, really, and, yeah. and found a way through it. Um, just, yeah, I, I hope. I hope our show brought a little bit of something to, to people out there listening and, and watching on Facebook. Uh, but I just, I don't know, I, I feel a little bit proud of myself and, and proud of my, my cohorts and, and, and friends in, in recovery that like, you know, went through some stuff over this and, uh, and got through it. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't easy on certain days, uh, you know, definitely. So if you, you know, it's interesting because we're now starting to get back into in-person events. I was in Calgary last week and they had the, was it last week? I don't even remember now. I think so. They had the stampede and they're completely open and people everywhere. And it was just, it was a really nice feeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, this week, those of you that follow our Facebook uh, feeds, it's uh, Vancouver Pride Week. Um, but unfortunately, Vancouver's still in, in uh, you know, a bit more freedom, um, but it's still a little locked down. But we're going to still do our, uh, you know, one of the show's uh, supporters here, Last Door Recovery Society, organizes Clean Sober Proud every year. You know, our intoxicated events become one of the largest, you know, substance-free uh, events in the world. Um, you know, we had to limit it to 100 tickets this year. I almost was like, are you out of your mind? We're not doing this. Uh, like, how do you do it? How do you do this for the hundred people? And, and then it was like, well, the spirit of the event needs to carry on. And so. so, and we can't do a virtual event really because you can't Facebook live it because of copyright music with the drag show. So, so that's, you know, just changed the whole thing. And, and you know, tons of emails to all my friends that have emailed me and said, hey, you got tickets. I'm sorry, but we just don't. Uh, we're limited. So Alma Bitches, Jaylene Time, Kendall Gender, Continental Breakfast, Eva Scarlet, many other performers, Lola, you know, returning. Uh, they were doing a great show for us on Saturday, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Those tickets are sold out. You know, there's none. But the Recovery Day BC memorial tree and uh, our this year we did a recovery mural as part of clean sober proud as part of our virtual float parade entry that's going to be on display at jonathan rogers park so everybody there's still a pride event going on it's just not like years past uh it's at jonathan rogers park this year friday saturday sunday noon till six we have a substance free uh clean sober proud booth and a memorial tree display on the Friday and Saturday only. So come down, visit. You know, it's a great park, great neighborhood, East Van. Well, is it East Van? I don't know. It's by Main Street anyway. But it's just a great neighborhood to hang out and um, come say hi to us. 
Yeah. People, people will understand. We've, we've been, we've been getting used to disappointment uh, over the last little while. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So, so come check it out. Vancouver pride, uh, Jonathan Rogers park. And uh, we're super excited uh, for those of you that may not know, but recovery day is coming back uh, September 11th. If you uh, know somebody that wants to set up an information booth, let us know. We're, we're trying to get recovery day back to what it used to be like in 2019. Um, so check us out. We're organizing all that. And if you want to volunteer for recovery day, we need volunteers. So come uh, email um, uh, myself, Giuseppe at lastdoor.org and our committee meeting is on August 10th. So anyway, that's what's going on in the world of, uh, you know, events. So, you know, we're living in this COVID isolation world. So let's get out and do stuff and, and let's make it awesome. Um, you know, a couple other things been going on. Uh, we're, we're excited to, um, so this is really big stuff. I haven't even posted it on Facebook yet, but I, I will later. So anybody that watches our show and has watched our show and has seen, uh, Darren, uh, listen to my rants about Health Canada and their grants and how their grants are always for harm reduction and you, the word recovery is nowhere in a grant proposal coming out of what's called the SUAP grant and, you know, Everybody gets their ideas of the healthcare world from Twitter and Facebook, but there's just so much that goes on that people just don't see the granular piece of it. And anyway, it's called the Substance Use Addiction Program, hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government to support safe supply initiatives, smoke inhalation room initiatives, consumption sites, you know, millions of dollars for safe supply projects. We're talking hundreds of millions and nowhere in there is there anything about recovery or recovery oriented systems of care for those of you that listen to our archives and, and remind us on twitter of the stuff we say um you, it's it's true like health canada told us that it's not part of their mandate and they told us you know we've applied for recovery grants and you know zero you want to open up a room with a closet where you can smoke crack in, you know, here's a hundred, you know, here's a million dollars but oh you want to create some kind of recovery oriented system no there's no money for that well, guess what, Darren? They just came out with a new SUAP grant for 2021-2022. And guess what's on there? Grants for recovery-orientated initiatives. So I'm not saying that, you know, we had anything to do with it, but, you know, I hashtagged and tagged, you know, Minister Patty Hedju a few times, uh, probably 100. And anyway, it's now part of the grant. They've added, you know, uh, funding to go along with everything else which is recovery oriented stuff so so by watching our show and listening to our rants i think we're making change in canada um that's a big you know can't swear it's radio but that's a big deal it's a big deal so i don't know what we're going to do and how we're going to apply for it but um it's a start amazing amazing yeah. good job you're part of that you're part of that a lot of people are a part of that you yeah know? a lot of people susan yeah. Brenda, all these people, um, uh, Ranteed, uh, you know, we got tons of people that are part of it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Talk Recovery Radio. We come to you live every Thursday, powered by New West Recovery. Hundreds of guests, thousands of listeners. You can catch us on SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube. You know, pick a streaming channel, search for Talk Recovery Radio. You'll find us, stream our, our, our soundtracks. But every week, the reason why people listen is because we talk to <laughs> recovery uh, and addiction experts from around the world, personal stories, the scientists, the doctors. We always have wonderful guests on our show. And today, no different. We've got a great guest. Darren, who are we talking recovery with today? Oh, this is amazing. We get to talk recovery with Chantal Jovin. Welcome to the show, Chantal. Now, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Bear with me. I'm just going to go through a little of your bio here. Um, I, 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 it's, I'm always, I feel blessed and, and honored when we have, you know, guests with, with such amazing bios. Um, obviously, Chantal Jovin is the, an author. We're going to be talking Love Without Martinis, How Couples Build Healthy Relationships in Recovery, based on real stories. Uh, but that is but what one of your three books, uh, 
you also have The Boy with a Bamboo Heart and, and another book called Where We Begin. Uh, in addition to being an author, Chantel is an international corporate attorney, as well as an adventurist, cyclist, speaker, <laughs> presenter, teacher, uh, and proudly supports her husband's sobriety. Uh, she is an alumni of the Caron Treatment Center Family Education Program, and her pathway to recovery includes Al-Anon, individual and couples behavioral counseling, as well as numerous personal growth workshops. Again, welcome to the show. This is amazing. I want to talk first about you because, you know, reading a bit about becoming an international corporate attorney, uh, you were born in Ottawa, Canada, French Canadian. Uh, your beginnings were at Gowlings, uh, a, a Canadian law firm, uh, became general counsel at a Fortune 500 global company then general counsel at Western Union, negotiating ventures and deals and big banks. And we're not here to talk about that, but it is interesting to me from that and as well as writing stories of human triumph, inspiration, uh, and of course your own journey of, of life and relationships. A, a woman in that, in that corporate field, how did you maintain or anybody for that matter uh humility and and not have your be overtaken with your ego and 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 greed and whatnot a, li a little bit of just how did you do that <laughs> oh wow that's not the first question i expected um i think just love life and be grateful that there's so much adventure and so many experiences out there and so many people to meet um, I just love life. And so I'm a very small part of, of all of that. I, I guess I just assume that, you know, when somebody goes into that, that corporate realm and, and goes through the education and, and is, is brought up, like it takes a drive and it, and it, it takes a, you know, a real type of personality. And it, when I, when I saw the books and I read on the books that, and, and the content and, and, and what they were about it, it was like, wow, like, like, it seemed like this is someone who took the time to smell the roses, so to speak, in, in your travels across the world, like, you, you also paid attention clearly to human nature and, and, and met people and were inspired to, to write these stories, which is, which is fantastic. And is that where your own story, you know, as you became a writer, uh, found its mark? I just believe that it's great to connect with people. And I was fortunate enough in my career to be able to work in places like Japan and um, Russia and Cambodia, where people lived very different lives and had different opportunities that we as Canadian are fortunate to have. And the pleasure is in, in listening to people and just seeing how they see life, it gives me greater appreciation for my own life. But I also find that it's all relatable. You know, whether I was talking to someone um, just starting off in their studies in Japan or more recently in Myanmar, we all have sort of the same drives in terms of wanting a certain um, life for ourselves. And that's a commonality we all have. And it doesn't matter if we're an attorney or a writer. Right. I consider myself an adventurer foremost. The others are just things I do. <laughs> that's amazing. That was, that was exactly my third question is, is like, what are you, you know, in your own terms, what are you? Are you an author or, you know, a, adventurist? I, I love it. That's fantastic. And now another common theme I'm sure you found across the world was uh, addiction, um, codependency, uh, you know, like that's, that's human nature across the board. Um, so love without martinis, how couples build healthy relationships in recovery. Um, this leads to your own personal story. So tell us, um, when did you meet your husband and how long were you with William um, it, the, well, while he was in active addiction? Well, 
it really is a good segue to what we were talking about. I actually first met um, Bell uh, in a swimming pool in Africa, in Ghana, wow. <laughs> at a company <laughs> event. <laughs> um, it was one of these sweltering uh, days and we had had a corporate event and gowns and tuxedos and the likes, and there was no air conditioning in Ghana um, at this particular hotel. And when all of the guests left, um, all of us colleagues decided to go in, in the pool to freshen up. And uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, the president of the company had not left the hotel and came to join us. So I literally met him as I came up for air in the swimming pool and thought, oh my God, this is not the best way to meet the president of the company I just started working for. <laughs> Uh, that began um, a long friendship because he's also Canadian. He's from London, Ontario. And we would uh, meet at company events three or four times a year to eventually end up in Denver, Colorado, which is the corporate headquarters of Western Union. Um, and eventually our friendship blossomed into a romance. It's a very long way of saying that I actually really didn't know very much about substance use disorder. I had no idea um, that Bill had a dependence on alcohol. And in fact, it, it took the better part of a year um, when we were living together for me to realize that this dream life, because he's also a cyclist and adventurer, he's lived in Argentina and he's lived in Paris. And this great life we had envisioned together um, was going up in smokes and I couldn't understand the acrimony, the tension until I discovered one morning um, that he was drinking very early in the morning and hiding it. Mm. Um, and I was one of the typical uh, partners of sort of like deer in the headlights, like, sure. wow, this, I had never seen my husband uh, inebriated. I had no concept of him uh, drinking. I saw him have a glass of wine, but that was it. Mm -hmm. And so, that was the beginning of my journey. It was a very rude awakening, <laughs> to say the so, least. So, so that rude awakening piece—that—that's the moment. So, lots, like, lots. Of, <laughs> I work in the treatment center. Darren's, you know, worked there. What were the phase? What were the stages? So, that next day, did he go to rehab? I don't think so. So, <laughs> no. so, 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 to all the wives that are listening um what what did you do did you go well, what was the next step so you had that aha moment it's like oh my god I think my husband has a drinking problem uh, what did you do <laughs> I, I turned to books okay <laughs> I'm obviously my training is I'm an attorney um I started I went straight to the bookstore and picked up all these books and to see if there was anything I could find out, because of course, I felt that my role was to help him stop drinking, even if I hadn't really had the conversation with him about it. Um, but what I found was that immediately as I was reading, I found that, wow, this is much bigger than anything I'm ever a handle. I can close a multi-million dollar deal, but this is way out of my realm. So wow. I actually <laughs> turned to- That's a um, big a statement, eh? That's a, like, think about that. That's a big statement. It's, it's like, how do you, how do you, you know, solve this mystery? It, it was, and it was a lot to absorb. And I, I did not have a concept that it was a disease. I didn't have a concept that it was affecting me, although it was affecting obviously our relationship. So the next step I took is I, I had um, Bill see if he would accept to go to couples therapy because I thought a therapist who's trained will quickly identify that the problem is a substance use disorder. And unfortunately that's what happened. Uh, we did a few couples session and both individually with the same therapist and together. Uh, she gave him a phone number, literally handed it over to him and said, you need to go see an addiction expert. That was in October. It took till February for him to uh, accept that he needed to go for treatment. Yeah. And that was a long four months of my life. <laughs> and there is the denial, the excuses, the continuation yes. of the same old behaviors, attempts to hide it again and self-control. All of this. 
all of that happened, all of that happened, all of my self-doubt that I was exaggerating, um, that perhaps I was causing it. There had been a lot of events in uh, Bill's life that had succeeded rapidly. Uh, he had retired from corporate life. We had moved from Denver to Philadelphia. He had lost his mother. Um, he was not getting along with his children from a recent divorce. So there were a lot of um, reasons to point to. Sure. And of course, Christmas came along and there was obviously a lot of celebrating and there were a lot of people who overindulge and were you know, um, enjoying the, the Christmas cheer. And he was apparently fine, relatively speaking. So all the comparing out which happens a lot with people who are able to function very well right. with their alcohol. Um, so all of that happened. It's, it's, there's a universality to um, both, I think, the addiction and the recovery process. And, and about the recovery process. So this is the point. I, I don't really answer the phones anymore, but you're talking to a wife and she's talking about her husband's drinking problem. This is a men's program. And then you're like, okay, now what about you and the mm -hmm. wife's on the other phone and she's like well what do you mean i'm like okay well <laughs> there's naranon there's alanon there's you know support groups and then there's like you know silence <laughs> so so bill's not here um so what about you so you now have a husband in rehab because uh, he's drinking too much you know what did you go through? I mean, you, the, the love of your life, you got this beautiful how retirement apparently is happening and you're supposed to be enjoying this. And, and, and yeah, a, a glass of Pinot Grigio with dinner is nice on your deck. Right. So now your husband's in rehab. So, so to, what did you do once your husband showed up to rehab? Well, this is interesting because actually I started going to Al-Anon the week after I discovered wow. that um, he, you know, there was a there was a potential problem with alcohol because at that point I didn't understand all of that. But in the books that I read and all that, there were so many references to Al-Anon, and um, I happened to be living in Philadelphia with my husband, and there were many groups. So I right away went to Al-Anon, and that was very very useful. It was very supportive because I found that I had best friends, of course, but they didn't understand what was happening and the people in Al-Anon did. And exactly what you're saying, they're saying you need to focus on you and your life and all of what the program is about. Um, and, and the other thing that I did is when Bill went away to treatment, I participated in their family education program, which was fabulous. It was a three-day program. And that also helped a lot my comprehension of what was happening to us as a family unit. Um, and by the way, we weren't, um, we weren't even engaged at the time. We, were, we had decided to move in together. So it was a big commitment. And one of the big questions that I was facing in Al-Anon was, well, do I stay with this person? We're not engaged. We're not married. And this by everybody attending these meetings, this is going to be a long road ahead. Do I want to do this? And uh, fortunately, I said yes. And uh, in February, we celebrated 12 years of, of sobriety. So it was, it was a good choice, but it was a very, very long process. What I also did is um, when Bill went to treatment is I, I hired my own personal therapist. I was fortunate enough to have the means to do that. And it was the first time I'd ever engaged in therapy in my life. So, you, you know, Darren, you're talking about humility. It's, it's a very humbling experience <laughs> to go through that. And and in a way, it's a gift because it also allowed me to address some, you know, some of my own healing that I needed to do. And this is, I think, the point of love without martinis. The, the, you know, I'm fast forwarding to me writing this book. But one of the main reasons I wanted to write this book was to share the message with other couples that it's not a his problem or her problem. It's a it's a us challenge. And there's, I have to recover, you have to recover, and our relationship has to recover. And I think a lot of relationships don't stay together because there's not necessarily that understanding that there are really three units that need to heal. And they're not going to heal at the same pace either. Amazing, An amazing point. Um, 
there's so much of the psychology for someone else who isn't in the problem that suggests little work but for me you know and i mean you mentioned humility i hear so much of it where where i don't say all part most partners you know sort of just sit back and and are a little bit relieved that their their partner is now getting the help that they need and you know i'll wait for a phone call from a counselor and i'll do my best to have that conversation but to like i mean so many conversations of apprehension about just going to an Al-Anon meeting, you know, cause that's, I'm going to have to talk about <laughs> my stuff and, and reading up and acquiring your own therapist. Like, do you, do you think based on that experience, there, there is any other way through it than, than an all in approach for the, the partner of the substance user? Well, my personal opinion is that um, if you want your relationship to not only survive, but grow, you and your partner both need to get involved in the healing process. And when I wrote the book, Love Without Martinis, I had the opportunity to interview the then CEO of Care and Treatment Center. And he's been doing this for about 25 years. And he said in his experience, there were three categories of couples. There was the one, which is, I'm in recovery and it's, it, you're over there. You know, I, uh, I want no part of this, which is basically denial. And as you can imagine, those couples don't survive. The second category is great. You know, you are sober now. Um, that's great. That's your thing. I have my thing. And uh, that life goes on. In, in his 25 years of experience, those couples, they, they usually end either emotionally or legally because the connection is never really reestablished. And then there are couples, and I'm fortunate to fall in that category with both my husband and I, you know, jumped in. And part of that, I think, are our executive skills because we are used to putting a plan together and yeah. implementing and making sure it works. Now, there are many ways to recovery. And I think Al-Anon is a wonderful way and AA, but I think there are many, many ways. I don't think that's the only way. Um, but I think that it is essential that both partners get involved. I don't think that's negotiable. Now, the getting involved for the partner that doesn't have the outward drinking or drug problem, um, they're, they're going to be, like I said, apprehensive. Um, what, what is there, is there a codependency there? Did you have to admit that you were a codependent? How did that feel that all of a sudden, you know, you're admitting 50% of the problem is, was that, was that a hard notion to face? I think coming to terms with the, the dynamics that have happened in the couple is, is really hard. And um, I like to really support the whole concept of um, improving and, and taking the stigma out of you know, substance use disorder. And so codependent is just as hard for me to say as for my husband to say, you know, I have an addiction problem. Um, but I, I like the, the word attachment because attachment, we all have attachment and yeah. we can have healthy attachment or a dysfunctional attachment. And certainly during that whole period that um, my husband was struggling with his um, substance use, I didn't like who I became. I, I've been on my own since I was 18. I put myself through school. I've lived all over the world. I consider myself a pretty independent woman. And all of a sudden I became so enmeshed in my, my boyfriend, fiance, I didn't recognize myself. And so, yes, it was hard. I had to admit something's happened to me, even if I'm not struggling with a substance, even if I can have my glass of wine and enjoy it. I'm French. I mean, I still have a glass of wine for dinner and that's okay. And then I walk away from it. That's a lot easier to do than what you're talking about is looking at myself and saying, wow, I'm part of this. And yes, you know, I, I also have to do some work 
and I've become too enmeshed with the person I love. Yeah, I mean that's that's just it. And and so in that in that beginning phase where you know problems discussed, it's in the open. Bill's gone to get help. There there's a natural separation, and and the mm -hmm. other you know yourself or the other partner is is either gonna continue their day job and go about their stuff or find help themselves there there's a natural separation in in pathways at that point do you talk about in your book or can you tell us a little bit about when is the appropriate time to align those those paths of recovery and and what does that look like um you know are you doing the same the same soul work, if you will? Uh, are you attending the meetings together? Uh, you know, what, what, is that, what does that look like? Well, I think it is also individual and for the couples. And, and in my book, Love Without Martinis, there's the, the stories of six different couples okay. and each of their journey is slightly different. And for example, there's the couple Larry and Sherry her journey was very different because um, she had had almost 11 reoccurrences, relapses. Okay. So you can imagine that the issues surrounding trust um, and accountability, and they also had three children, was a very different pathway than uh, Bill and mine. And as you know, when you enter recovery, you know, life doesn't go on hold. Life doesn't say, oh, great, you two are working on your recovery. Um, we'll just like leave you alone. Well, the universe doesn't that. work that way, yeah. right? Um, seven months after Bill um, entered recovery, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So we had no choice. We had to come together and deal with some pretty hard issues. And, uh, you know, because the kind of surgery I needed meant that we wouldn't have a family together. Those are pretty big decisions to make right away. And um, so in our particular case, we came together fairly quickly and we wanted to, we really had a desire to, you know, get our lives on track. And um, Bill was retired, or but wasn't sure it was a full-time retirement. I put my legal career on hold and we wanted to go cycle and do all of these things. But what we did is we engaged in a lot of work individually with therapists. Um, and then we did some couples workshops, you know, a weekend here on communication, a weekend there on intimacy. Um, and so we were, we were, you know, collating a, a, all these processes because we're trying to find a way. And that was our drive. If you look at some of the other couples in the book, um, for example, Tim uh, and Chuck, they had been together a very long time and they went back to their normal lives when Tim came back from treatment. And, you know, Chuck is an IT fellow. I mean, he's a help desk. So, of course, he, he wanted to help Tim do everything. And to your point is that they had to really um, create a path for each of them to engage in their own lives together. So I think it's, it depends on the couple, but one thing is key. There's going to have to be some work that is done together and some work that's done individually. So that's what do you, in all the couples. What do you do about um, the big elephant in the room? I'm pissed off. Like you, I'm <laughs> mad at you. Um, you've relapsed. I'm mad. Like, where do you, like, you can't get mad at somebody for having cancer and cancer remission. Uh, you know, you can't get mad at that. But somebody goes back to drinking or using, there's, there's anger there and there's distrust there. And usually there's, you know, sometimes, you know, for some families, it's gambling and, and money issues and, mm -hmm. and maybe adultery as well. And depending on the addiction and what do you do about, you know, putting it in a disease bucket and then, hey, like I'm pissed off at you. So does that get touched on? Did any of your, were any of your couples mad at each other? <laughs> oh, of course they were. And I, I was mad at Bill. I don't care. He didn't relapse. I was still mad at him. Yeah. Our lives had changed. Uh, you know, I, we love to cycle. We were going to cycle in France and it's like, well, do you cycle in wine country now? Or is that like, that's gone away. You know? So that's of course I was the treatment center road, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, 
I, I think part of it is, and there are a lot of cross addictions, like you've mentioned, you know, there, that's just part of the mental health world we live in today. And you can't, um, you can't ignore that. I, I think the path of recovery, the, the real beauty of recovery, and we haven't talked about it much, is that you develop the skill sets to deal with life as it occurs. The, the goal of recovery is not a perfect life. That doesn't exist. The goal of recovery is developing the skill sets to be able to deal with life in a caring, responsible, nurturing way. Mm. And so all the issues that you've raised, of course you have to talk about them, but in the process of recovery, there's a lot that shows that in early recovery, what we can deal with is today. That's the early stage of recovery. As we move forward in our recovery, we start beginning to be able as a couple and individually to deal with the past because we are now getting more grounded in ourselves. We have more coping mechanisms, et cetera. So we're able to deal with the past. And as you go further into your recovery, particularly as a couple, you begin to be able to create a vision of the future. So you begin to be able to talk about what are we doing in the future? Because now we've developed skills that allow us to have the confidence that even if there is a relapse or even if there is cancer, that we as a couple will be able to face that and have a future together. So how we talk together about time shifts a lot as we deepen our recovery. It's, you, you speak a great deal, and I'm sure this is in the examples of, of, of the couples in your book, of the difference of a, a victim and survivor perspective and how much that, that initial stage of, of, let's call it rec recovery, um, I, you know, I didn't realize it in my own personal experience, like really how much I had to will myself into that more survivor perspective. Like, okay, this thing, like, for example, the, your, your cancer diagnosis. I mean, that could have been just the, the, the woe is me and, and the added stress. But like you said, that was also what brought you guys together is, is there a lot of examples, uh, you know, through this, through this work and writing the book where a, a life stress, uh, a grief, uh, a, what you, what we would consider a, an awful situation, uh, actually be a catalyst or, or, you know, the primer that sort of changes the course for, for the couples or is it blessings and, and, you know, goodness and everything working out that, that makes it easier? Chocolates and clouds and sunshine. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, in recovery, there are still thunderstorms. They yeah. just still are. <laughs> um, but in recovery, you know that if there's a thunderstorm, you have to go into the garage or under shelter or pull out an umbrella. In, in, uh, in addiction, you know, you don't know, know that. You just stay there and get wet. <laughs> but, and yeah, so... it's, a lot of it is being, I, yeah, I like the word, be naive. You, you actually, like before I came into the rooms and showed up to treatment, like there was a bit of me, like I actually didn't have a clue that uh, mm -hmm. there was take my own inventory. Like I, I didn't learn that till I was in my 40s. Take my own inventory. It's your fault. Why would I do that? You know, so so there's a lot of things you learn along the way. So uh, uh, here we are, Talk Recovery Radio, 100.5 FM, powered by New West Recovery. And we're talking about the book, Love Without Martinis, How to Have Couples Build Healthy Relationships and Recovery. I have a question uh, about the book. It says introducing the six practices of the ascent approach to recovery from addiction. What is that to our listeners? <laughs> so these practices, it was interesting. The, writing this book was really a journey. It started off as I wanted to share the stories of couples. And because probably my training as an attorney in negotiations, you know, I like to draft things out bullet point and be visual about it. So I had the stories of all these wonderful couples and, and their, their, their journeys. Um, and then I had done a lot of research at the outset of the book so that it would be um, 
informed, it would be researched in form how I would ask the questions and do my storytelling. And then when it was all done, I realized I needed someone who had a lot of experience and credentials to write the introduction. And uh, Jeremy Frank did that. And he's a clinician with 25 years of experience. So when I looked at my great big wall, it was it was like, you know, those flashing lights going, oh my gosh, look at what the research says. Look at what the clinical experience says. And look at those couples that have successfully, you know, um, grown their relationship. They're all these parallels. And so decided to go about and actually document those parallels. And it became the ascent approach. And ascent is just a mnemonic to make it easy to remember. But there are behaviors that couples that engage in have, um, are successful in rebuilding the intimacy in their relationship. And so the book just introduces them as practices. They're not steps. They're not like one at a time, but they're behaviors that really help nourish and nurture the couple. Wow. That's brilliant. So it's, is the book also like, like you say, is it, it's not a, a like a workbook. Do you do, is there, are there exercises involved or is it strictly just a <laughs> narrative of what the ascent approach is and how it can benefit your life? My gosh, do you have a crystal ball? I've just um, in the last few weeks decided oh, that we will works. work on a work, that we will create a workbook because I'm, I'm having this question a lot. Um, and because the Ascent approach was created afterwards, there's not a significant focus in the book. But we will starting to have, um, we're doing one workshop with couples actually in the fall at care and treatment centers. So we will be, um, really putting sort of a hands-on approach and there will be a workbook that will follow but for the moment couples uh, or readers can uh, go to the beginning of the book and uh, the six practices are there and if we have time I can quickly go through them um, or not they can look in the book and then as you read the stories of the couples you can see how they've been practicing and how it, it does help their relationship you know grow together. I would like to learn. We got some time still on the show, so definitely. Okay, great. Um, so it's a sense. So the A stands for assess your readiness to change. And uh, this was really important for me. I wish I had known this uh, when I was going through the process early on, but it is as a couple, we need to identify the areas that each of us are ready to focus on. And sometimes we have um, individual trauma that we need to heal or individual work to do, and it's too early. Mm. So to make this really concrete, because my husband and I were in a second marriage, I really wanted my husband to talk to me about his um, relationship with his um, adult children. I was hoping for a blended family. He had a lot of, of um, shame and guilt he needed to process. And so he wasn't ready. And so we had this tug of war around this, this area of our relationship that if I had understood he wasn't ready yet, it's not that he didn't want to, he just wasn't ready. I, it would have helped me sort of put that on the shelf and say, hey, why don't we work on our intimacy? Because we were both ready for, to work on that. So that's the first one is the work of the couple identifying what they're ready to address at this particular time. Um, the other one is structure your time. And I think we all know that early in recovery, whether it's as we were talking, Darren, about that enmeshment um, or whether it's because with addiction, there's so much lying and chaos and all of that. Structuring your time allows us one to create uh, predictability and accountability. I say I'm going to be home. I say I'm going to make dinner at six o'clock. I do it repeatedly. And that means that it starts building the trust. So structuring your time is very important. And also we give time to the things that are important to us. So if I say I'm going to go work out on Wednesday, then I'm signaling to my partner that health and well being is important. The other one is create your community. And as we know, Addiction is really um, a disease of isolation. And so creating community, creating connection is really important. And why that's important for the couple is that we get to show up without all of the baggage that we have and all the trauma we need to heal. And we get to try skills again 
we get to learn how to create boundaries because it's a lot easier for me to say no to my neighbor about having coffee than it is for me to say no to Bill about anything because I always want to be supportive. So when you practice skills with new community, you bring that back into your relationship. So it's kind of a safe way and you create connection, which is really important. The E is for engage in your life um, in addiction and in dysfunctional attachment. We forget about what we like and we stop cycling. Chuck, you know, left his tools in the garage gathering dust. Um, and this is a, I bring back into our relationship, the energy and the passion of what I like to do. I, as an individual, and we share that. And so engaging in my life and you engaging in your life brings back um, a lot of freshness to our relationship. Then there's nurture your spirituality and whether you're religious or spiritual, um, nurture your spirituality is all about that inner calmness. And you know, in a relationship we we're talking about arguing and the big white elephant and all of that. Yeah. Well, you know, what, what we do when we, build our spirituality is we we increase our inner tranquility and so when we get into those tense moment we're able to break down the reactivity chain you know you say i say you say that old pattern if we have that um sense of who we are and being grounded we're able to recognize that's happening and hopefully hopefully you know stop that old pattern and one of the ways to do that is through our spirituality and the last one is treasure your partnership, you know, and this is so important. This is the fun part. This is creating the vision of what we want to do together, but it's also our love language. Um, we all have those terms of endearment with our partners. What we're saying in that moment is I see you and you are special to me. Um, and I'm not ashamed to say that although we're, you know, big executives, I refer to my husband as my lion. And that's, that's us, you know, and it's very personal. And he knows that I'm talking about him and I'm seeing him. And in Treasure Your Partnership, we honor the behaviors that we like in the other. And that's so important because in addiction and, and all the chaos, we've forgotten what it is that we love about each other and treasuring and celebrating um, what it is that's unique about our relationship goes a long way to giving us that connection that we need to grow together. So that's really quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love the, the, the ascent of, of approach there. Um, I, I think you hit an amazing point that, it, well, it's, it's not often a, a conscious uh, idea that the A, the very first assess your, I, don't, I wanna use your words, say, say A again. Assess your readiness to change. Readiness to change. I wrote down willingness. And, and that is, I think, for everybody in life, you know, unless it's this big obvious problem where people intervene and we, we get forced to go see a, a therapist or someone who's going to, you know, get us talking, I think everybody has something that they're just going through life you know, suppressing, avoiding, distracting themselves from, and how many partners that I witnessed that were just too mad, you know, not cooperative in, in the, in the process, part of the couples, it was always sort of like this, how, how dare they? Like, you know, what's, why? You know, oh, they're just mad. They need some time. Yes. But time for what? If they're not really assessing their own readiness to change, to uh, bring about the consciousness of what kind of sacrifices they're probably gonna have to make in order for this relationship to get together, I think is such an important uh, you know, step, conversation, narrative uh, for anybody that, that's beginning in this process. So I think, I think as you were just, you know, talking with couples that you became a researcher here and, uh, and definitely, I, I think that needs to be a, a big part in, in anybody that's treating, you know, an individual and, and learning to work with their partner. 
that that's that's something that they could help identify with that partner is their readiness to change. And because I'm sure a lot of relationships that just end in, uh, yeah, I can't do this, I can't, I can't trust this person, are are just simply as a result of somebody that's that's not ready and unwilling and maybe both, you know, at that point and probably the 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 relationship needs to separate at that point did you have conversations with couples where it i mean as a result of them separating it, it, it's now better you know maybe well, co-parents or, or the the focus of my book really was um, to illustrate the the journeys of couples who stayed together yeah. in recovery and and rebuilt their relationship so that i interviewed many couples Many of them are not, most of them are actually not in the book. Uh, but I really strongly believe we need more stories of recovery. We have so many, so many stories of, you know, the dysfunction and, and the trauma of addiction. And we, we need to celebrate recovery and, and how our life does improve and all of that. And so I really focused on couples who did the work and have grown together because you need to grow you know it's not about going back to how you were before it's about growing together into this new life that is open to everything that life will you know throw at you I mean look at the last year a year and a half there's been a lot for all of us to deal with and so the skill sets it's funny we're 12 years in in recovery now and we used this model during the pandemic when we started facing tension. So I didn't really focus. I do believe that some couples will eventually um, will separate. There's no doubt about that. It happens probably more often than people stay together. Um, so the key is the ones that stay together and they manage to go back to, to not go back, but to create that relationship the way they want to in recovery. How do they do it? And this is what this book shows it's guideposts it's stories I and mean, when you read the book you will hear couples yelling at each other you know me included um because it's real life yeah it's one of those opportunities where recovery will either help you mend the relationship and create a new one or will help you have a parting of ways in a respectable way um, and where i work we've seen people rekindle their relationship and we've seen divorce mm -hmm. papers show up but there's a recovery adds a level of respect um, and, and that's, you know, uh, sobriety is part of recovery, but it's way more than that. Everybody just thinks it's about not drinking, but it's not. It's like treating your ex-wife as your best friend, you know, because she's the mom of your kid. I mean, there's a lot of guys, you know, if you're watching the show that are just, I never thought of it that way. It's like, yeah, it's your kid's mom. How would you like somebody <laughs> talking to your mom like that, you know, and, and people get this perspective on life and, and it's really important. And, you know, to, if you're watching the show and you have a partner that is, uh, you know, using, uh, drinking excessively, the number one thing you should do is, 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 you know, I'll give advice out here, which we usually don't is get help for yourself. And, and, and I always like to say this too. The moment you start getting help, and the moment you start going to Al Anon, and the moment you start to understand, the gig's up on the person that's <laughs> using. It's like she knows, you know, or he knows. <laughs> that's the beginning. And 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 it's, you know, I start opening and and you start realizing it's like, yeah, I got your game. I got your game. And <laughs> And yeah, it's a disease, but it's also when you're using, and I can say this from personal experience, it's also, a, there's a game involved and, you know, who can I get to do what I want them to do when I want them to do it? And that's my own personal story, I, you know, uh, for others is totally different. So that's just one of the journeys that can initiate recovery is, is somebody in that relationship getting well. Thanks I really appreciate. And some more advice pick up love without martinis exactly yeah yeah How, where did the title come from well i um i not only love to cycle i also love to motorcycle and i was on my motorcycle brainstorming about my next book and thinking about love without you know love titles sober love and they all seem sort of not that um interesting to me and i don't know i was just motorcycling and all of a sudden it came up with a 
love without martinis yeah i kind of like that i love it um, i love it yeah <laughs> because you do you need like dinner changes you know that one thing you do every day you know mm-hmm. going out for dinner at a, at a fancy restaurant and that's changed and so how do you still love in that so i love the title i love the book uh so your website is um uh, chantaljobin.com so that's c-h-a-n-t-a-l a j-a-u-v-i-n.com it's on our website page it's on top of recovery facebook page so you can click the links there the book's available everywhere but you can also get that through your site and also uh, read up on the many other projects you have going very talented thank you very much for for bringing all this to to light and so forth we appreciate you being on the show thank you very much darren any thank closing you for the thoughts? conversation yeah uh, I just, uh, you know, I'm just reminded of, of all the times, you know, when couples come in in the, in the, in the same, uh, you know, circumstances as, as Chantal and Bill, and it's just a struggle. It's defeating and, and you know, the, the conversation today in the book and, and the outlining, you know, specific to couples that, that got through it, I think is so, so crucial and, and so important to, uh, because anybody that's, that's in a treatment center or struggling in addiction has a partner or someone in their life. A mom, a dad. Yeah. From, from the ascent approach or, or, you know, just reading up on, on some hope hmm. is that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that with us. Talk Recovery Radio comes to you live every Thursday, noon to one on uh, Vancouver Co-op Radio, 100.5 FM, and also here Facebook Live. One day, Darren and I will be back in studio in this post-COVID <laughs> world. Looking forward to uh, sharing microphones there. And if you caught us at the beginning of the hour, don't forget this weekend, it's Vancouver Pride Week, and we've got Ooh. the Clean Sober Proud booth, and we've also got a display for the Overdose Memorial Tree on at Jonathan Rogers Park, noon till six Friday and Saturday in-person events open to the public. Sadly, our Clean Sober Proud dance is completely sold out, uh, but uh, you might be able to hear the music on the other side of the fence. So happy Pride Week, <laughs> Vancouver. We'll see you at Jonathan Rogers Park. I'll be there all weekend. Uh, Darren, hope to see you there. Chantel, thank you for being on our show today. And thank you. Everyone, it's been a pleasure. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. See you next Thursday.